So this morning we will be focusing on Psalm 124, in particular uh, verse 8. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Brothers and sisters of our Lord Jesus Christ, this morning's psalm is the kind of psalm we might read or sing after a close call. So for example, uh, you were driving and almost lost control of your car on a slippery road, or maybe did lose control but ended up safely in the ditch. Or you may have narrowly avoided a, an industrial accident at work where there was a, a hair's difference between returning home to your family and loved ones or not. These sorts of uh, situations or images make us shudder at what might have happened. And we're led to praise our God and give him thanks for his care and protection and his help in our time of need. And so may be led to sing this song, read this psalm, and reflect on this verse, verse 8, which are words that we also acknowledge together, confess together at the beginning of every worship service. It's also possible that this psalm resonates with us or is appropriate, appropriate in reflecting on with regard to just our simple day-to-day -day life in general. Our daily life, we acknowledge and confess, is not just a matter of course. We don't know what is going to happen day by day. There are dangers that exist all around us such as the ones that we already considered, but also other ones, spiritual dangers, for example. The devil is hard at work to attack us and our loved ones constantly. And so we find comfort and encouragement in this psalm and in this verse. Now there's two things that we need to consider when we reflect on this psalm and what it might address. First of all, the psalm is not primarily about myself. It's not about my close call or my past or my future, but it's about ours. This psalm is spoken in the plural. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side. Secondly, it's not primarily about narrowly missing an accident, but it is particularly about narrowly escaping the attack of the enemy. We read in this psalm, when people rose up against us, or when their anger was kindled against us, that's the context of this psalm. Foremost, this psalm is a confession about what would have happened or might happen if the Lord is not with us, if the Lord has not intervened in his people's crisis, and in this case, a national crisis. If the Lord had not provided his help, our people would be in deep trouble. So this morning... Let's hear God's word proclaimed under this, under this theme. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. That's how we summarize this message. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And we'll see two things. First of all, who can be against us? And then secondly, continuing that question, if God is for us. So first of all, who can be against us. The author David is voicing danger. Danger that he, uh, perhaps as the king of Israel, or his people that he rules over Israel, is facing. People rose up against David. People had rose, risen up against the people. Now we don't know exactly what the situation is that David is referring to, what he has in mind when he composes this song, 
uh, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Maybe that is also intended by the Holy Spirit so that we don't just think of one situation that David is in or his people Israel is in. So that we can also apply this psalm and this verse to situations that we as God's people are in today. But considering David, we might think, for example, of how Saul, who had become jealous of David, began to attack him and seek to put him to death. Or further on in David's kingship, when his own family, his own son, rose up to put him to death and take over the kingship. Or we can think about the situations that arisen during his kingship from the nations round about. And what comes to mind, for example, is what we read in 2 Samuel 5. In 2 Samuel 5, there we read about how David is anointed as king of Israel. And immediately, we read, when the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel... All the Philistines went up to search for David. But David heard of it and went down to the stronghold. And there we read how the Philistines are seeking to end David's kingship very quickly. So angry, so intent were the enemies of Israel, the nations round about, to control the king and the nation. They organized themselves against Israel again and again, bent on her destruction. One thinks also of how the church in the Old Testament was attacked by spiritual forces, the devil himself as an enemy of God's people, leading them presenting them with many, many temptations to to lead them astray, to lead them away from the worship of the one true God. Now there's four metaphors in this psalm that are used to describe how great David's and Israel's danger was. So look, for example, at verse 3. It says there, they would have swallowed us up alive. That presents a picture to us of of the kind of danger they were in. David brings, conjures forth this image of a great sea monster, like Leviathan, or like a large fish, such as Jonah encountered. Or maybe David's thinking about an earthquake, like the earthquake that swallowed up all of Korah's men alive. The enemies of of Israel, the enemies of the church, want to swallow up David and Israel. In verses 4 to 5, there's another image, and that is of the flood. The flood would have swept us away, we read, or further, the torrent would have gone over us, or, or would have gone over us with raging waters. The picture here is of a, of a great flood or a wild river overrunning its banks, engulfing and drowning its victims. We have seen images of this from time to time when there are tragedies, natural tragedies in the world. In verse 6, there's a third image Uh, presented, and that is that of a wild animal, where David talks about he as king and and the people of Israel as being prey to their teeth, where there's this idea of a wild animal that will tear the people apart. And then finally, there is the image of the fowler in verse 7, like a bird In the snare of a fowler, we read, the fowler's task was to catch birds or even doves for sacrifices. They caught them with a snare or with a net. 
and once they were caught, they were doomed. This is how David describes the danger he and the people of God are in. And what's common to all these examples of of danger is that which leads to destruction, which leads to death and extinction. And not only of one person, but of the entire nation, the entire people of God. We mentioned already that this is one of the pilgrim songs. That is one of those songs that were regularly, traditionally sung on the way to Jerusalem for the sacrifices, for the festivals. And it was in those those pilgrimages that the people of Israel often met with danger or hostility. Sometimes they were confronted by wild animals or on other occasions by thieves and robbers. Also here, the psalmist expresses the danger that they might experience, the anxiety that might rise up because of the attacks of evil. So who else are these enemies that are against them? Well, they're not God's people. They're not part of the beloved of God. They're not part of God's church. They are those who do not serve the Lord God and obey His voice and law. They are those who might feel threatened by those who are God's people. They are those uh, whom we read, for example, in Romans 8. Those who, who persecute the believers, because of their faith. Those who, who are intent on destroying the truth, destroying God's people who confess and profess that truth so that we are facing death all day long. The enemies are those that are described in Paul's letter to the Ephesians chapter 6, those entities, those those principalities and authorities of the heavens, the spiritual forces round about. The psalmist is addressing then also the spiritual war God's people experience. Like our catechism makes note of Satan and his whole dominion, Even our own flesh do not cease to attack us. We think of the lusts of the flesh. We think of the movies today. Pornography and other things that lead to addiction. We think of consumerism and the need to have all the latest gadgets and expensive toys, the things of this world, the luxuries of this world where we seek the pleasures and the fun of this world rather than sacrifice ourselves to the Lord. We think today about the attacks on the church, on public prayer, on the freedom of religion, on the preservation of two genders, on Christian ethics in general. We are reminded and and aware again how as times progress, the possibility increases of imprisonment, of suffering, of even succumbing to death because of our Christian faith. That is a realm of possibility that is closer today than it was even a year ago. And I do not even mention, brothers and sisters, the tens of thousands of believers, maybe even millions, who are being persecuted this very day, who are being imprisoned, who are being put to death because of their faith in other parts of the world, right now. The church, Zion, God's people, believers, face these dangers Today, just like David did and the people of Israel did in his day. 
And what our psalm is teaching us is that we can all, like David did, like the people of Israel did, we can face this impending doom with great confidence. And we do that when we depend on the Lord. And that brings us to our second point. If God is for us. So who can be against us if God is for us? In this psalm, Zion, the church, praises God and the Lord as the single deliverer responsible for rescue. If you know the Old Testament, brothers and sisters, you recognize this God as the one who brought his people through so many perils in the past. In essence, Psalm 124 is a, an experiential psalm in, in this, that it, it expresses the church's faith experience. The people know, they ought to know, that through all of history, God has been with his people. God has been caring for, helping, preserving his people when they relied on him. And that's why we read in this psalm, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side. That's the truth we need to hold on to and to claim. The Lord, our God, is on our side. That is a fact. Fact, check true. God is not against us. He is for us. As Nehemiah writes, when the people return from captivity, in chapter 4, verse 20, our God will fight for us. This is the testimony of the believers of all times and places who have found themselves not simply threatened, but actually trapped. However, God's people, though captured, though trapped, are never consumed. Although they are trapped, they are not killed. Although they are killed, it is only in the body, not the soul, Jesus says. There will be tribulation for the believers, Jesus says, but Zion awaits. The Lord will set his people free from the tenacious grip of the enemy. The snare has been broken, in other words. We have, the psalmist says, we have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowler. The snare is broken and we have escaped. And it's not by our own doing. God has done it. It is because of God's power and grace that we are delivered. Think of 2 Samuel 5 again. I mentioned it earlier where it talks about David being anointed as king and, and how the Philistines rose up immediately against them. We read there in 2 Samuel 5 how David inquired of the Lord, what should I do? And God says, go up against them. Go up against the Philistines. And we read, David came to Baal Perizim and David defeated them there. And he said... The Lord has broken my enemies before me like a breaking flood. It's great words and imagery because it's turning the whole image around. At one time, the people of Israel were experiencing the raging floods of the enemy. But in the end, it's the Lord that becomes a breaking flood for his people. And then a little further... The Philistines come up again against David. Then David asks, what should I do? And, and the Lord says, don't go up against them. Come from behind. Use some strategy. And then God says, when you hear the sound of the marching in the tops of the balsam trees, then rouse yourself. For then the Lord has gone out before you to strike down the army of the Philistines. And David did as the Lord commanded him and struck down the Philistines from Geba to Gezer. When you, when you read this passage in 2 Samuel 5, then you, you start to think, 
is this, this is what David was thinking about. This is what, what the Lord was, was working in his heart and mind and soul as he composed this psalm, that the Lord fought for him. Our psalm therefore leads us to the beautiful confession of dependence in the end. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. That's our votum, our confession of dependence that we say together every Sunday again, every worship service again, as we express our dependence on God. Indeed, how could God, who has created all things, verse 8, be defeated by a bird catcher's snare? If the God of the covenant is sufficiently mighty to create all of heaven and earth, the whole universe, out of nothing, with his word, then we, his people, are safe with him always. This psalm, this verse, brothers and sisters, is like a collective sigh of relief of, of God's people. It's like we begin our worship with an element of relief and confidence that the name of the Lord is what carries us. Do you know what the name of the Lord means in Scripture? It stands for God himself. It, it stands for whom he all is. In other words, his name is his fame. It's his reputation. It says, as Peter says in Acts 4, there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. It's God's covenant name. His faithful name. It is, I am who I am. And I will be who I will be. It is referring to the God who promises forgiveness of sins and everlasting life to those who believe in him. This name, therefore, expresses fully, especially for us, not so much for David, who did not know all things, who has not had the full revelation of God, but we who do recognize in our verse today, verse 8 of Psalm 124, also the fulfillment of of God's promise to send a Savior, to send His one and only Son, Jesus Christ, who is also the seed of the woman. That God, because of our sin, because of the hostility of Satan, and the hostility between Satan and the seed, God sends His Son so that the just penalty, which is death, because of sin, is paid through him. God is our help in our most deepest sense. So looking beyond our enemies, the enemies of the church, we consider the enemy of sin and death. And it's the cross of Calvary, beloved, that is the ultimate proof and basis that our help is in the name of the Lord. So what seemed like a perfect snare to kill the Son becomes the perfect way for our deliverance. And Jesus, through his death on the cross, which is Satan's greatest attempt to end God's power and authority on earth, to end the, the life and being of the church, becomes the victory over Satan. Jesus, through his death on the cross, crushes his head, defeats him. He overcomes death. He rises up from the dead and ascends to heaven with all power and authority. How, brothers and sisters, how can the God who redeemed us by the gift of his Son then, he, Paul asks in Romans 8, how will he not also with us graciously give us all things? Who 
shall bring any charge against us, against God's elect? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? No, in all these things, Paul says, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We are convinced, therefore, there's that confidence. There's that confession of dependence. We are convinced that nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We as Christians in the New Testament age today are also pilgrims. We are also on our way to the New Jerusalem, to the great festival and marriage feast of the Lamb. And along that way, brothers and sisters, we do meet a lot of hostility. It's a hostility that even seems to increase from year to year. That Satan appears to be stepping up his attacks on God's people. That more and more we experience him prowling around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. In any crisis, then, we might be upset or worried or scared. But we don't have to be, the psalmist reminds us. We don't have to be, as Paul confirms, we don't have to be, as the leaders of the church have also encouraged us. Think what John Calvin says on this verse in, in Romans 8, that God's power raised to its appropriate elevation, is so high that the world, the whole world, belongs under it. God's power raised to its appropriate elevation is so high that the whole world belongs under it. Let's be persuaded in this way that all things are subject to God's will, that God governs all things in His Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith and trust in him, beloved, we can share in the same blessings that the Old Testament pilgrims shared, expressed through David in Psalm 124. That we are not given as prey to the teeth of our adversaries. And so in conclusion, we note that in personal crisis, but also, and especially more, as Church of Jesus Christ, the Lord is on our side, and he has rescued us, and he will always rescue us. God promises to be our help, beloved. Psalm 124 teaches us that the Lord triumphs over all hostile people. That he is our faithful covenant God, who is almighty and all-powerful. And so our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Amen. Let's join together now singing from this psalm, Psalm 124, all three stanzas. Mm -hmm. 